All right, John, welcome to the show. Thanks, Joe. Are you excited? I'm super excited. You should cry. I actually don't know what I'm excited about, but yeah, I'm, <laughs> no, I'm stoked. So those who don't know, that that guy right here is a good friend for seven years, right? We've been friends for I'm seven so years. I'm sorry. <laughs> for, uh, yeah, sorry for you. Uh, we, we, know, we work together in the EO group, which is Entrepreneur Organization. We actually, you, you knew about me before because we you did a lot of things. I don't know how much we were working, but no, nah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> and then uh, you exit your company, and I'm jumping. Right? You exit your company called Shipmunk. Not exit. You sold a piece of your company, Shipmunk, mm-hmm. at a very high multiple. It was a very high multiple, nine figure multiples, about a month after I did, right or so. Mm-hmm. Uh, in 2020, we both kind of like cashed out, nice and. Uh, the difference between you and I is that you're 29, you motherfucker. And all <laughs> those years when you're running the company, all I remember is I am right now in a safari trip. I am right now snowboarding in Japan huh? <laughs> while I was there breaking my back. And uh, yeah, so I think it would be awesome to hear how do you leverage lifestyle, doing everything. You, we're going to talk about a lot of his lifestyle, guys. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Oh. While he was selling his business, uh at uh, kind of like the interesting time in our life during COVID. So welcome. Welcome yeah. to the show. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate well, it. Well, I'm learning about it for the first time. So I don't, I don't know what you guys have no done context, together. Well. What kind of well, lifestyle, what kind of lifestyle, kind of adventures you've been on. So, so I, w- we'll I, w- I want to say about, about my, my, my thing with, with John, right? So John started Shipmunk, which is a fulfillment logistic company, right? Filling up and packaging everything, going after the small small companies that wanted to ship up their goods online, right? And he had probably the most creative method I've seen, kind of 2.0 type of uh, shipping companies, where the rest of them are very old school, uh, very uh, silverhead, much silverhead industry where all of them are, you come over to the office, they don't even give you a glass of water because they're very technical, they talk to you about what they're doing. When you go to Shipmunk, it's kind of like you're going into a little party, and event. <laughs> you need to see his, his location and everything was geared towards experience for the, the consumer, something they didn't do. And you're a kid, you're going into FIU, again, FAU, FAU, international yeah. student. When, okay, right? so when did you, when did you start? Because I was, I was even doing a little bit of research and you, Built Shipmunk off like a 30k, yeah, is it award. A- yeah, so it, so like the whole backstory. You know, I moved here in 2008, and then went to high school, played hockey for two years, got a scholarship, and then moved to FAU. Um, and I started the first business, which was similar to what Shipmunk is, but something different. We were buying products in the U.S. and shipping them internationally. So, I, you know, got a little bit of my feet wet in logistics and e-com. Uh, and this was back like 2010. I kind of started doing it first for friends, eventually for kind of other people. And then 2014, I graduated and I won a business plan competition with like 27K of, of awards and, and prices. Um, and it got accepted to an accelerator program also at FAU. And so they gave me like a free warehouse space for a year. An additional, I think, 25K. So like by the time I graduated and was going to launch this thing, I had maybe like 70K in award prices. And this warehouse space for a year, which just kind of was like an amazing runway to start a business with. Because I was deciding like, okay, do I want to take the risk and, you know, do business full time? Or do I like try to go to work and like start a business on the side, you know? And so the 70K kind of gave me enough confidence that I can try to do this without like going to work and, you know, trying to do both. So, But why, why logistics? Like how did you, okay, so you have 70K, like was it part of a competition? It was like a case study? So it was, yeah, business? no, so the competition was a, it was a business plan competition. So I was basically yeah. pitching. What I was doing is like, you know, if you lived in Europe and like you wanted to buy, um, I don't know, some specialized like clothing that wasn't really selling in Europe, right? Or they weren't shipping internationally. This was 2014. So a lot of companies didn't ship internationally. It was too complicated. It took too long. So we would basically provide the service of we'll buy it for you and then we'll sell it. You know, we'll ship it over to Czech, let's say, and then like you'll have this product, right? We would give them an address in the U.S. essentially and then forward it over. So that was kind of the original concept. And with the business plan competition... The pitch was we'll take all that, put kind of an automated platform on it, and then make it global. So like we don't just service check, but we service everybody. So that's how, you know, when I graduated, I basically like went on, hired like a developer and started building this platform. And then, you know, in the first year, somebody basically called me up and they're like, hey, you have this warehouse, we read about you in the newspapers, like can you do fulfillment for us? Mm-hmm. And so it kind of, you know, and I started looking at it and I didn't really know what fulfillment was. And I was like, well, there's a big gap in the market for SMB mid market fulfillment um, needs, right? Because everybody still in 2014. This is 20, 
14, yeah, like okay. early 15. And what and explain like what the landscape was like because so, now it seems so easy. You yeah, have well, some, yeah. now I mean yeah. now there's a lot, you have of, your lot of competition, yeah. right? Yeah. But but uh, back in 2014, there was maybe one company that was servicing like the SMB market. Because also remember, what was like, that one company? It's called Shipwire. Um, they got acquired. Shipwire. Shipwire. Yeah, they okay. got acquired by Ingram Micro in 2013. Okay. So the landscape, like if you think about like Shopify and like all these you know businesses that are starting online. Um, that whole era of these entrepreneurs starting an online D2C brand really started around like 2010, 11 with Shopify actually probably creating the best platform for that. So all these like old school logistics companies, they kept working with like much bigger players and it was a lot easier to manage, you know, four or five clients in a warehouse than two, 300. So nobody really wanted to get in because it was too complex. There was no software, there was no processes, like it was very complicated. And so we didn't really know what we're getting into, but it's like, well, nobody's doing it or they're doing it terribly wrong. So let me try to get in that space and figure out how we can do it better. So we started building that solution to say, we can service you know, 300 customers in a building or 500 customers in a building, built our own software to run the warehouse, our own software to kind of provide the um, order management, inventory management system to clients and kind of connect the two tiers and then ultimately you know, provide a service that at the time, not many companies were providing. And the other piece was, like Joe said, right? Like all these companies are old school logistics companies. So it's like they're run by, you know, like 50 plus year old dudes that just are not like fun. They don't speak the same language as like most of these e-commerce founders that are millennials that are very marketing brands driven. So we, you know, build a cool brand around Chipmunk, got a more millennial, you know, we wanted to kind of give this vibe of, of Zen, right? Which is why we picked the monk as kind of our logo as our mantra. And wanted to create a whole experience just a lot more modern, right? From the office space to, um, you know, any interactions with our people, like anything, it was just, it was trying to be like different. It was trying to be more of, I, you know, these are the people that speak the same language, not like, you know, it's like my grandfather um, classmates that are like running this company, right? And that's kind of the, the vibe a lot of these other companies had. Okay, makes sense. So um, when, you, when you first launched this, you said, okay, so you have like whatever, 70,000 bucks, you have warehousing, um, I guess somebody, you, basically somebody, found out about what you were doing and then sort of prompted you to go down this route and build this out. And that was like one customer. But um, how did you find your first customers for the business? Like, what was it? Yeah, so it was, um, so the first customer was the, the most random connection. Like, there was an article that came out That's about That's the person that us. called you up and was like, hey, can yeah, you do yeah, this yeah. for me? Yeah, so yeah. exactly. So it was, uh, it was a company out of Fort Lauderdale, actually. They raised uh, a couple million bucks to build, like, smart home products for Apple. And so, yeah, so like this guy calls me up and he's like, hey, my wife, my CEO's wife read an article about you in the newspaper and my CEO wants to support local business. Mm -hmm. Like we should work together. And, you know, I didn't really know what he wanted because we didn't work with U.S. companies at the time. So I met with him. He basically told me like, hey, we've had a terrible experience with our previous company and like we want to support you and, and work with you. So that was like the first customer that even like explained what the space is like. And, you know, I went and met with them and I was like, man, this is going to sound great. But they were like a year away from launching their product. So in the meantime, I started more, you know, researching the space and I went to a couple of trade shows to really figure out like, okay, maybe I can talk to a couple of customers to see if they can use us. Um, I went to CES in Vegas, which is like a consumer electronics show because they just seem to be like a logical place. And I basically just was like telling people like, hey, you guys need fulfillment. Um, you know, there's plenty of startups in that like little startup section. And so I, cl I closed maybe like first five customers. Um, you know, like most of these guys barely you, you, just You didn't have started. a process built. Up. I didn't have anything. No, like I, I didn't even like know how I'm going to do this, right? Like I was like, oh, you know, we have a warehouse in Florida and like we're doing this for plenty of brands. I mean, it was like fake it till you make yeah. it that game for yeah. sure. We we're like, we have this amazing you software. Did you we sign the deal at the time with that warehouse? I no, so I had I already was in the warehouse part of that accelerator program, right? Oh. But it was like thousands. Did you sign the feet. customers? So okay. I yeah, so go <laughs> a thousand this square show. feet, a thousand square yeah, feet. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like this <laughs> like office, this, yeah, like like <laughs> this, this exactly. Um, <laughs> and my mindset CES. was like, hey, well, I'll get the customers. I'll figure out how we're going to do this later. Yeah. Um, and that's exactly what we did. I came back from the show. I had probably five customers that I signed up. Most of them decided to ship us inventory without ever seeing what the warehouse looks like, right? I even, like, I remember I had one customer that would come to visit, and I would put, you know, because it was a thousand square foot cage inside of a big building. So I put, like, fake boxes, like empty Amazon boxes that just built to took off the tape and just put them on the shelf so it looks like there's some product. I think that's how Costco, uh, Costco started. They, they had empty space, and they put empty boxes on top. Just to make it look like you're yeah, actually functioning Yeah, make it look like they have stuff. Yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> that's really funny. But, I mean, it's like, well, because you want to, 
I mean, that's the scariest thing, right? Like you finally get a customer, they want yeah. to come visit to make sure you're real. Yeah. You're not really real. <laughs> like how do you do yeah. Like how do you tell them like to give you confidence? And yeah, and like we just, we did it. You know, we I kind of sold the guy on the fact that like, hey, I'll be the one basically shipping your stuff. And he ended up signing up even though he, we had really nothing to sell at the time. And that's ultimately how it kind of started. So like I signed up the first five customers. Then I brought in one of my college buddies to basically do commission only sales. Um, and you know, he would just call people. This is like a super scrappy, oh, super, super, super scrappy yeah. startup. Very scrappy. I mean, it was like, yeah. And then this guy was just making commission only. All right. Yeah. And, and, uh, we didn't, I, I didn't know any revenue models or anything like that would even tell me like how much you paid this guy. And so we just figured out some numbers and you know, we didn't have our target customer. Like we didn't know anything. So I, this guy just, I bought a list for like hundred dollars from my, uh, one of my friends. Uh, it was like a list of medical device companies because we just thought maybe medical devices would be like a cool thing to do. Which, by the way, medical devices are even today we don't ship medical devices because they're so <laughs> complex and like you need yeah. all these like Regu requirements, regulations. Yeah. Yeah. You need like all these certifications, like ISOs, and you're like, why? Wow. Like we, you know, we spent like a couple hundred grand on compliance like now, and that was the first target customer that we went after. Like just that's how naive we were. But he was just dialing these guys in, like calling every single one of them and trying to see like, hey, do you guys need fulfillment? Um, and he did end up landing, you know, maybe, I don't know, two, three customers. And like, it was a very slow progression from that point. Like we just signed up one, two customers. But because e-commerce was in such an inflection point at the time, like a lot of these brands, you know, you would sign them up, they were doing 100 orders a month. And then suddenly they would like skyrocket to like 500, right? The, the next month and thousand the next month. And so organically as the brands we were onboarding were growing like we were growing with them so it was kind of a mutual just there was a huge benefit of their growing we we're growing you know we're onboarding you feel like, you feel like there was um, a renaissance for the online sales throughout i don't know from 2013 to, because of social media 2013 all the way to i would say 2020 and then 2021 collapse of the i mean some sort of a correction for that renaissance yeah i mean i, I for sure i mean i think the it opened up the opportunities for anybody to start an e-com company, right? In 2013, I mean, you didn't really need a lot of money to do it. Like, yeah. could buy any white label product or got an idea for product, right? Build it. Um, you know, Shopify would allow you to have the, the the front end of it. We would allow you to have the back end of it. And like, anybody could launch a brand within a couple months, right? And everybody wanted to do it because it's cool. And there's all these great success stories of people, you know, starting out of their garage, building million dollar businesses and like basically working from home and like not having to have massive teams. Um, and we were definitely riding that wave where, you know, I mean, you like brands like yours, right? Like it was just yeah. such a great time for, for that. It was, it was a great time to be alive and actually do it because I, I just saw a billboard where it says uh, Richard, uh, the, the owner of Fashion Nova, sent me this billboard that says 100 million um, orders uh, just sold. Thank you, Fashion Nova. Bye. Shopify. That shows you that a multi-billion dollar brand works with Shopify. Shows that when you want to launch a business, you don't have to worry about infrastructure anymore. You don't have to worry about logistic infrastructure because you have the ship bank. You don't have to worry about building your own website. You have Shopify. And if you're a small business all the way to a multi-billion dollar, you can still work with Shopify. So the, the ability to, but it was more about supply and demand. How many people are going to come fast enough before it's too late yeah. to go through that and, door? And, and the challenge is like, you know, especially with what's happened with iOS 14 and like the challenge in advertising, right? Like during COVID, obviously the cost per acquisition for all these brands went zero, basically to nothing, right? Because everybody was buying online. Yeah. Nobody was spending on ads, like no travel. Like obviously a lot of these other industries just went to a totally away. And so these brands just got really spoiled with like, man, we're, you know, it's costing us three bucks to acquire a customer. And then things started normalizing 21, right? Yeah. And it started to, like other people started advertising, which then naturally already increased the cost. But then you had this, this huge, um, you know, shift in the, in the, in the targeting, which just became even more difficult to ultimately get the same return. So like we have examples of brands whose cost per acquisition, you know, went up 10 X, 20 X. Okay. So this is what I've heard. I've heard that in 2022, that if you have positive ROAS on your first customer, you're a unicorn. Yeah. Because it's so rare. So that's what the e-com environment is dealing with right now. So that means yeah. you have to have like your LTV on that customer has to be significant. Yeah. And you have to have. And also the attribution is all screwed up because of iOS, too. Right. Exactly. So, and, I mean, like it's that, never really accurate. Yeah. It's never really accurate. Now there's actually um, there's actually tools that will somewhat replicate the accuracy. I can't remember the name of it now, but there are some e-com tools that rep, try and replicate the accuracy of like pre iOS update Facebook. But yeah. I mean. 
Google's pretty much all you have right. for accuracy yeah. in terms yeah. of attribution, right? No, and it's and it's you know it's uh, I think what's what's happened right, and like we're kind of seeing it because we have a pretty broad customer base. I mean, we got I would say you know 1,500, 2,000 brands that we work with. They range from small like one month, you know one person, 10, 20, 50 orders a month uh, shop, all the way to our largest you know is a you know 200 million. Well, now actually we sign up even larger ones, but like half a billion dollar brands that, you know, will do hundreds of thousands of orders, right? So we have a pretty wide range of, of companies. And I think where you see the biggest impact is the ones that um, have been solely relying on social media for acquisition um, have been getting obviously hit the hardest. Now, the other challenge that you throw into this is, is this whole supply chain delay issue where, you know, during COVID, like nobody could get their stuff in. So everybody over in You feel it gets stabilized now? It's getting better. It's definitely not stable yet. So not stable container, right? I mean, all the transportation pricing is coming down on the ocean and air freight. Like you know, where it used to be what twenty four k for container, now that's yeah. coming down like pretty significantly. Sixteen or I think now it's like yeah, sixteen, fifteen. You know, it used to be before that it was two, four five. Yeah, two, yeah, two yeah. three. Sometimes yeah, five. Yeah, but it's um, it's getting better, but it's still not there. But the problem is like everybody because they got so kind of, they got their asses handed to them in like 2020 because all their inventory was sitting in the water while they needed it, you know, for peak. Then 21, they got all the inventory, but they, they weren't selling as much, right? Yeah. And that's happening in 22 as well. So right now, like everybody has all this inventory, but they're not really selling, which is, you know, inventory is finance, so it's costing them money, so mm -hmm. that's kind of hitting their bottom line. So even the brands that we work with that have been super profitable, doing really well this year, they're just having really like tough time, major tough, tough time, financial challenges, right? And it's you know over inventory. What's the challenge now for you outside of the supply chain issues? I mean, I was gonna say, do you have to like yeah. change your like your your ICP, your ideal customer profile? Do you have to like audit your customers a little bit better so that just challenge so, in your business? Yeah, well. I mean, so I think um, scaling has always been a challenge, right? Like when you grow, you know, we've been, I mean, we've grown to, uh, we're, we're 2,500 people now. So like in five, six years, I've grown to 2,500 people. That in itself just is How many locations? 19 warehouses. Now. You have 19 warehouses now. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. In like 11 locations. So What's have, the average size of a warehouse? Uh, I mean, I don't know. In an average, we have three and a half million square feet. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, it just depends on the market, but... You know, I would say the biggest challenge is just making sure that as you grow, like you continue to stay agile and like be able to make quick decisions and 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 the team scales with the growth. So like we're, you know, we're opening the, this year, I think we opened three, four new buildings and getting the team set up so that they can operate pretty quickly, right? Getting all the equipment order, getting the training done, getting everything kind of up and running. That's a really challenging piece because, you know, you're trying to deal with three of those at the same time and the amount of people that can actually train the people is just very limited because we don't have that many people that have been with us for a long time so you need to like replicate them right and then put the processes and the structure in place to allow us to do that over and over again so i think that's generally the biggest challenge is to make sure you've got the right layers and the right people in the right spots to um to allow for that scale so yeah. you're saying that growing the business is more just a traditional scaling tiering the business finding the right people is more challenging than the actual supply chain issue because it's still a massive space as it is. In yeah, the so, so the challenge for us, right, like we don't get involved as much on the inbound part of the, so like if you're our customer, like you will typically work with somebody else to get the inventory over to us. So it has a big impact on our customers, but we don't, there's nothing really we can do. I guess my question on this one was supply chain issues plus iOS issues causing a shrinkage in uh, online sales and yeah. Is that more of a challenge than just scaling a business? So, or? well, yeah. So, okay. So that in itself is a challenge of like organic natural growth of our customers, right? So okay. if you look at our customer base, wow. you know, the, the, like let's just say they've shipped, I don't know, whatever, 20 million orders in last year, right? That same amount of customers are probably going to ship the same or less amount of orders in 22 because mm. they've had all these challenges. So right? all those years, you basically had natural growth of each client and you just got to make sure you retain the value of each customer. Now you have to keep too. chasing more clients. So now we have to bring in new business. Yeah. So now yes. we have to bring in a lot more new business. Like if we want to hit the same percentage growth rate, like we have to bring in a lot more new business mm. to offset the fact that our clients is not growing as fast. Because like in 2020, right, without doing literally anything, like if we, even if we didn't onboard our, any clients, we would just double our business, right? <laughs> In 22, wow. you know, we need to onboard, like this year, we're probably onboarding $100 million of new business. And that's all, you know, like new business that comes on. But then obviously the existing business possibly shrinks a little bit because of 
it's kind of the, the so, challenge. So here's, the here's, a, here's a question that I guess it's an evolution, evolutionary part for a company like yours, or maybe not. So at first you started with the lower hanging fruits, small mom and pops that nobody wanted to deal with. Now with competition, everything. Are you trying to double down more on the big size companies, more than the little ones? Yeah, it's a great question. I think that's kind of the biggest like answer or question we're trying to answer internally right now. The benefit of working in the mid-market small you know, businesses is that it's very complex and not a lot of people can actually do it. The downside is there's only so many businesses in that spectrum. And a lot of them, you know, it's not very stable, right? So in the SMB category overall, like you bring them in and then some of them go out of business. You know, some of them are just, you know, it's, it's a little bit harder to manage that piece of business. If you sign up a $50 million client, you know, you know that you're gonna, they're going to most likely be there in five years. You sign a longer term contract. So there's a lot more stability, but the margin profile is also very different, right? So yeah. I think it's... Um, so you deal with them different than you deal with the mom and pop? For sure, yeah. I mean, you, you know, you have a little bit of a different operations. You, you know, you, you put more effort into making sure that they typically build them kind of a more of a dedicated space in the warehouse. But also then you have EDI and pallets and shit. Yeah, like that. it gets a lot more, yeah, right, more, you know, more omni-channel, right? They'll yeah. do B2B, they'll do B2C, they'll do, they'll need more buildings. They'll have, you know, a lot more kind of handholding. So like, I think we've, we've operationally, it's not really an issue, but it's just naturally, if you go to up market, your margin string because you you know you're pricing that more aggressively, right? And you and you have to. And now you're saying there's a lot of competition in your space. And and yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of competition because a lot of venture money have flown into the space. And you know, we've been bootstrapped. Like we've been, we've always put all the money. Um, kind of, we we've always wanted to be profitable. So like a lot of our competitors that raised hundreds of millions of dollars, they throw money mm -hmm. at acquiring customers and they'll pay to lose money, right? To, yeah. to serve them. Which is challenging for you. Which is challenging. If like, if you're trying to make money and like you're competing against somebody that is okay to lose money, then like, it's like, how do you win the deal? Like you yeah. can be better, but Sony's offering 20% cheaper service. Like you just can't compete with it. Right. So now it's changing. Like even the ones that have raised a lot of money, their valuations are coming down. Nobody wants to give them more money. Right. They are right sizing their pricing because huh. they realize they have to make money. So it actually, they actually have to operate easier. a business. Good times, good <laughs> yeah, times, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like, hey, like there's actually businesses to make money at some point, you know? <laughs> and look, there's businesses that like in software, there's definitely a world where, you know, you have to spend money to acquire a customer. Yeah. If you have enough of a lifetime value calculated, like you can lose money to acquire that customer. And at some point you make money. But in logistics, it's like, or in, you know, in fulfillment, it's, it's if, you're, if your gross margin is negative, you know, meaning like you, you know, I ship hundred packages for you and I lose money on every single package I ship. There's no way that I'm, that's ever going to scale. Right. Yeah, like, yeah. and, and, and a lot of these companies, that's what they're doing. Right. Like they're just burning through cash and like they think that with scale, they're going to figure it out and actually their cost is going to come down. But it's, it's a, it's a, it's a cyclical thing I've seen in many categories where you start with, um, don't show me profit. You better not, um, until it, the whole market turned into EBITDA driven. And no investor wants to touch you unless you're profitable. And from one day to another, it switches. Yeah. And and the problem I've seen with companies, and I've, I had that when I had buyers coming to buy big private equities, and they said it's kind of like a Kool-Aid that you give a company that was already operating under debt. They're used to operate under debt. Now you tell them now you start need you gotta make profit now. They don't know how to ever turn profit. Well, it's a cultural thing. Right? Yeah, it's like a cultural you, thing. Because if you think about like, and, and this is kind of the funny thing, right? That's like the market today, obviously, is everybody wants to see profit forever. You know, forever. The last, well, the last whatever couple of years has been like, oh, just want to see growth, growth. Like we don't really care if you're making money. You actually shouldn't make money. You get, you know, you should burn as much as possible. There's a funny thing that one of my, um, one of the investors that I've spoken with maybe five years ago, I've asked this, this lady that works for private equity, I say, hey, what do you think is our biggest risk? We weren't growing nicely at this time, we're pretty early, like maybe 10 million in revenue, but we're making money, you know, we had like a million EBITDA at that time, right? And I asked her like, hey, what are we, you know, what, what are we missing, like what's our risk? And she said, your biggest risk is to be profitable, because then <laughs> people are gonna value on EBITDA multiple and not on revenue multiple. You know, and I was like, how screwed up is that? Like, That's you, so you know, messed up. I mean, it's, this is it's... this is this is where, where I think it's interesting. I, when when and I think you should tell the story when we're talking about that. You were and she wasn't wrong, actually, probably because when you're in January, you're all getting an offer. Yeah. And then that offer changed by the same buyer. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I don't know if you can. Ex yeah, I can't. I mean, I can't say the names, no, but no. yeah, that, that is right. Like this was well, this was in 2020. Right. So but I've never I've never really operated in a business where you're not trying to be profitable. So I've never really experienced this. But 
So explain to me why somebody who's a VC, private equity, looking at a company that's not profitable, how, why do they value it at a multiple on revenue? Well, because there's no, I know there's no multiple on EBITDA. You can even you value. Can, you value by the space. If you don't have the measurement of profits, it, it, it happened with, uh, with Jeff Bezos. Jeff Bezos was convincing his people for 20 years that he should not be turning profit. He want to take over. The, he want to own the fulfillment so no one would be able to beat him. And they were furious that he was the most hated person in a boardroom every time he would come in, but he was, he was standing his ground until he turned profit. He took him 20 years. Now, that kind of like changed a lot of perspective for companies. But that's also true. the only metric that you can even... No, it is not. But for companies, in the, you see, it's different when you're, when you're not profitable on the SaaS. Because mm-hmm. you have ninety five percent retention or whatever year over year. Well, gross margin is like. But then when you have, like when you sell a particular yeah. product, when you sell a particular goods and you're actually pushing money out, the engine has to make sense. And it's like, don't worry about the engine; it will make sense once I open another seventeen locations, and yeah. the logistic is going to be cheaper and so on. So it's very hard. It worked for some, and it modified the whole industry mindset for investors to say. Don't show me your profit because that's going to be your, yeah. your judgment. Because what else? Because I mean, if you think about it, right? If you're an investor, somebody's yeah. showing you a business and they're like, hey, this, you know, we're 10 million in revenue, losing money. Like whether they're losing a million or 25 million, how do you use any of that to value the you business? Can. You have to look at yeah. the revenue. You have to look at revenue. And you have to look at growth. And you have to look at, you know, the industry comparables, right? But like in our world, you know, it's, it's in software where you're losing, where, where your gross margin is 90% or 50% or 70, whatever. But you're losing money overall because you're investing in acquisition. Yeah. It's like you can make that argument somewhat that in the future, when you have enough of a customer base, you're going to turn profit, yeah. right? I mean, that's what Uber did. That's a what lot of yeah. I mean, this well, the, the the crazy thing is there's a lot of examples where this worked, but, then but there's, there's, you don't hear about the ninety percent of the examples where that. Well, doesn't you do work, sometimes. Right? I mean, that was majority Bolt. don't work. You know, Bolt. Yeah, yeah. So they that didn't work for them. I think they were. I think. I think it's. Bolt. I don't know Bolt. Bolt is a payment processing mm. uh, software, basically, and they basically grew with ridiculous valuations. I don't think they were. Ever no, you're talking about Fast. Fast. The one click. Oh, fast. Sorry, one not click. Bolt. Yes. Bolt was a competitor. Excuse me. Yes. So Fast did this, yes. and then a billion uh, dollar valuation. Yeah, it was like billion dollar valuations. They raised three hundred million dollars at a billion dollar valuation. Went bankrupt like a month after they raised that round. Yeah. Something like that. But that was. The issue, right? So they were still software, mm-hmm. and I think their I think their revenues were, were like I'm gonna get this number wrong, but it wasn't like the hundreds of thousands per year. Yeah, that there was, was nothing it. special. Like, the one click, okay, the, everyone and their burn has a rate one click. Was yeah. like 10x their revenues, yeah, but like well, but, was, but that's the and, and like that's you know because there's been so much money thrown into venture, like yeah. that's just you know forcing these investors to invest, which is artificially driving these valuations up, which is forcing the entrepreneurs to spend money, which they don't necessarily need, right? So it's accelerating the cycle and there's definitely examples where it's worked great right so you know that like amazon was kind of the pioneer in that yeah. and it's worked well but like i think there's so many other businesses where or verticals that you just can't do it right yeah. or you know like some of our competitors exactly in a gross negative margin environment they're claiming like oh once we get big enough and we'll you know have all these customers that's when we start making money but i think chewy is a great example if you look at chewy which is a dog uh, online pet store Chewy was acquired for $3.5 billion by Ryan Cohen. And he sold this to, I forget the name of the private equity that owns, I think, Petco uh, and, yep. or, or the other. Yeah, and then they took uh, it public. The other, and then took it public. Yeah. It got to a point that there were $30 billion valuation. And then they fall off a cliff. But well, once it turned EBITDA driven, because there are no, it's still not profitable. Everything they've ever made, they're losing money. The actual engine is not profitable when you ship uh, 40, 70 because, pounds because you have a dog co- food. You have, you have cogs. You have like you have. You have everything. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, but it's 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 like a musical chair thing that a lot of investors are playing, where they said, okay, there'll be sixteen rounds or so. I'm gonna just yeah. jump from this round to another round. Yeah, yeah. Uh, can I go and I still? But beat you know, this what? I'm gonna get out before anybody. Yes, deal with this exactly. Issue. Exactly. <laughs> it's a musical chair. Definition of a Ponzi scheme. By yeah, the way. It's like, technically, yeah. it is not a yeah. lot of underlying value. Which, I mean, it's it's. You know, it's funny, but like that's what a lot of ventures been like the last couple of years, right? It's like, hey, I'm investing in A. I'm just hoping somebody's going to invest at a higher valuation in C. Yeah. And I think that's where we're going to be up for a you know, pretty interesting realization right now in the next couple of months where all these people need money, but nobody's going to give them the same valuation they've given them six months ago. Nobody. So we're going to see a lot of, I mean, you know, there's just really funny memes now coming like around on, you know, around venture, which is just like, you know, people begging for money and VCs just basically like, yeah, like we're not giving you the money at the valuation. And you show them all the great business that this time it's actually working. Yeah. 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 Uh, So it's, you know, it's a tough, tough time. um, What are some of the the biggest fuck ups that you've made as you scaled? 
<laughs> Let's go through some of the things so that people have to. There's so many. Them. <laughs> there's, there's... Tell them about. Tell them about the one where you're on on some uh, on Black Friday. <laughs> tell yeah. them the Black Friday scenario. Yeah. So I mean, there's, you know, this is logistics. So there's a lot of fuck ups all the time. Like you're working with people yeah. and they always make mistakes. It's it's a it's a really interesting industry. But the, the what happened on Black Friday? This was maybe 2017. And we just moved into a new warehouse in Deerfield, uh, which is like 30,000 square feet. And then we were operating. And Black Friday is obviously the biggest day of the year for us, right? Like the sales go through the roof. And we hired a ton of people. And like we just get ready. And then I was actually in North Carolina somewhere. And I just get a call the day before Thanksgiving, um, which, you know, obviously that's the day before Black Friday. And they're like, hey, like we've got, you know, we've had a little bit of an issue with, um, with power. And we lost power. And, you know, we think it's going to be up like in two hours. Two hours that I could call and like, oh, the electrician came and the transformer burned out. Um, and there's no way we can replace the transformer until the morning. Uh, I'm sorry, until Monday morning, which was, this was Wednesday before Thanksgiving, right? And so like the like, none of the stores are open until Monday. Yeah. So you're going to be not operating for five days. Now in any other business, that probably would have been okay. For us though, like we literally, if we weren't operating for those five days, like we would be out of business. There's no question. Because you get so behind that like you just can't, hiring enough people to, to get out of it. So I flew back, you know, we looked at the situation. We're like, man, like we're screwed. Like, what are we going to do? We ended up doing is we ended up like basically cutting through a, a hole in the warehouse to our neighbor's place. And we tapped into their, uh, we tapped into their like panel, like electrical panel and basically ran extension cords. All we, I sent my like 20 people that I had like all to different like Walmarts and Home Depots and like bought all the extension cords they have. So we bought, I'm not joking, like 10,000 feet of extension cords, brought it all back, ran it from that one freaking panel in the other warehouse and just connected every single peripheral in the warehouse, like pack stations, scanners, Wi-Fi, internet, everything, right? Because the, the, the thing just burned down and we couldn't get any replacement. So we're like, well, without power, we can operate. So we, you know, it took us, I don't know, a whole day to kind of do that. And like, it looked like Honduras in there. Like you had just wires everywhere, right? Like it was just like in the streets of just, you know, <laughs> I mean, it was, it was crazy, but it was great to kind of see the team come together and like really solve this problem that seemed unsolvable at the time and really saved the business, right? Like it was, you know, we were, I mean, it, we had a one day delay, but made in and, and, you know, and it was, Nobody it was could great tell. to rally together. No Nobody tell, could yeah. tell. But it, it could have been pretty detrimental, you know? I, I think that, you know, like doing stuff like that is what defines like great entrepreneurship, right? Because a lot of yeah. people, when, when, they, when they hit a wall like that, they don't think of, I, I mean, even when you were closing customers at CES, like there's like attitudes that make a good entrepreneur because you look at where you came from, where you're at now, and everyone can be like, oh, you know, you, you rode the wave of e-com and dude, there's a lot of ways you could fuck this up along the way. Oh yeah. Like yeah, a yeah, thousand yeah, different ways. Yeah. You know, it's another funny one. Like this is, um, maybe not as fun. Well, it's pretty funny, but it's, it's, it's not as like, uh, that was a fuck up. Like we, so obviously the biggest issue in our, uh, in our business is like you miss, you know, you, you ship somebody else's inventory to the wrong customer. Oh, right. Wow. And so like you have a hundred customers in your building, they all carry totally different products. Right. And so we would have, you know, we would have products that would be like, like pet toys. We would have products that are like t-shirts and we would have like baby, you know, clothing or whatever. And we would have a customer, uh, that's, that's a, it's called cat lady box. It's actually a local company, great business, right? They, they sell products to like cat ladies yeah. and somehow, and actually like, I almost still think it was like intentional because this lady, right? Like we ship her, a, she ordered a, uh, like a cat lady box with all these products and we accidentally ship her a t-shirt, um, from like an influencer which was like this, this like young kid that like is like a YouTube influencer, and it said "Pussy Slayer" on it. Oh my god! <laughs> and we're just like, holy shit! And we saw the picture, you know. We, they, they, she's, and she took it so well. She was oh like, <laughs> you know, like I love my cats. Like this is not funny, and it just like, and it, it was literally like like oh Pussy Slayer god. on this shirt, right? And this this I just imagined this huge lady somewhere in like middle of Idaho, you know. Opening this, excited for this cat lady box. She opens this and says pussy That's slayer on crazy. it. That's crazy. And like, it was the most funny, hilarious mistake we made. And they were very like brave about like taking that. But we did have, you know, scenarios where we accidentally shipped like a, a, a strap on to, yeah. um, you know, a kid oh that ordered God. like something else. Like, unfortunately, and we, you know, we've been obviously processes around it to now not happen again. <laughs> But you have some of these like most random things that happen that are just you know about about funny. those those um, mistakes or things. What when we had our customer service, we had stories and we thought, oh, we got some stories with customer service. 
Uh, so we brought our CTO that had a dating site. And when we thought we know we have some stories, he told us his stories on his dating sites. Oh, I'm Date. sure he has ridiculous stories on his dating sites. I was site. like, listen, man, this website of yours, what's up with that? I'm taking this girl on a date and I'm buying her dinner. I'm dropping her off, but she doesn't let me go to her house or she doesn't want to come to my house. You need to call her and tell her to come to my house. <laughs> Are you serious? Yes. <laughs> what? I'm like, what? It's a good customer service. We guess like, yes. man, this guy probably wants you to show up. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Yeah, it's uh, it's fine. We had um, one time when this lady sent us an email, and she said um, that was early on, and when we didn't know what to do, I had I had always uh, a solution. So she said, "Listen, I've been subscribed for twelve months." getting your boxes. Now, I never really use them. I keep them. My house it was burnt. So what are you going to do? Give me the money back for all my boxes. <laughs> so it was all fresh for us. And I said, you know, usually you should tell her, look, I'm sorry, but call your insurance. But um, call Ipsy. Tell them the same story. See what they're going to say. That was early on. <laughs> so then Ipsy came up with their response and then said, it's exactly what we said. Just call your insurance. And we would pass it on. Every time when we had this, we, were, we also had a girl that uh, was saying, listen, um, you guys withdrew my money, but I didn't have enough money in the bank. So now I ended up with this guy. I got knocked out. Now I'm pregnant. So you guys have to take care of the baby now. <laughs> yeah, we had all kind of crazy stuff. How, how crazy did not having stories. money in the bank have to do? It's it's they're trying. They try. Oh, but you know what? Like I get I get I get messages. <laughs> You'd be surprised. I get. I mean, I would say probably a couple of week now in check. Yeah. Um, you know, because like like people have seen obviously the news articles and everything, and like they'll. They'll just email me random on, on, on Instagram and be like, hey, like, you know, I have a baby and like I, I'm a gambler and like I really need to borrow fifty thousand dollars to like build a new house. And I'm like, okay, cool. Like, great. Like and, would love to help you, but I don't think this is the way to like yeah. do it. And and you know, it's not like yeah, anyway, it's this just is not customer service. This is just people you, hitting you up for money. Yeah, no, no. But like, random people, right? Like that happens to me too, but I mean, <laughs> it's just weird. It's yeah. very strange. But I mean that's a, probably a whole bunch of scammers too, right? Oh, like, for sure, yeah. 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 No, I'm sure um. it's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, need, I need to connect you with this uh, FX yeah, I, trader I, I, guy. Like I he's been promising sure. me that he can yeah. make me billions of dollars. Yeah, I have please a great do, binary options for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, binary yeah. options trading opportunity. They're based that out of Kenya, amazing. though. But so yeah. I don't know if that's gonna work for you. I'm sure uh, it's gonna work. I have a question. Um, it's interesting because you both just mentioned like these like customer success, customer service stories. How involved should a CEO be in customer service? Yeah, it's a good question. I think it's very different in a B2C versus B2B environment. So in a B2C environment where you've got thousands of customers, like you have to, you know, you can't, like, I mean, I think you might be able to take calls, but it's very hard to stay unbiased. You have how many? You have 2,500 employees. 2,500 employees, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you, you can be obviously removed, but some people still try and I think what's important, the loudest yeah. complaints. I think what's, well, in a B2C world, right, like not our business, but like when you have tens of or hundreds of thousands of customers, like I don't think there's a way, I mean, you can take a call for fun like every once in a while, but I think in order for you to truly make a difference, like you need to just measure the right metrics and then ultimately help improve the business according to like what people are complaining about. In our business, we try to do the same thing, but our business, there's a lot more weight on the bigger customers. So like I'll, you know, have a personal relationship with a lot of the bigger clients that I'll know personally. And then... You know, I'll try to spend time with them to try to really understand, um, not necessarily like individual problems, but more, what, are, what are macro things that are where we can be better, we can help them better, we can create a better solution, right? Like what are the things that they're seeing in the industry or what are the things that are bothering them that we may be able to come up with a solution for, right? So I, I, don't, I wouldn't necessarily call it a customer service where yeah. like, I'm like, hey, this package like didn't ship, like I don't really do that. Um, although I used to a lot to kind of try to understand what you know, how the product is actually performing. But now it's more, what are the patterns? And then how do we make a better product based on the feedback? But I do think... How do, how do you do that, though? How do you keep it? You a talk to... The pulse? Yeah, yeah, so it's like the right data, right? So, you know, categorizing tickets and complaints and like really understanding like what are the different segments that people... Um, like the way that I, I'll give you a specific example, right? So when people complain, we mark a ticket. Like we kind of measure the the mood of that ticket right like is it a question is it a you know is it a bug is it like hey this customer is really pissed because we screwed something up like if that's the case we kind of classify it that way and then we choose additional category like what happened is it something we did or is it something misunderstanding whatever and then i'll have a reporting to understand okay like 10 percent of our tickets are all you know people that are mad 
And then this is the breakdown of like exactly what they're mad about. And then I'll typically productize it to say, how do we make these better, right? If it's the wrong product shipped to the wrong person, you know, operations is going to own it. It's typically going to be tied to a silver metric around accuracy. And I'm going to hold them accountable to improve that metric. If it's, you have it part of your meetings, like, uh, I don't know, stand-up meetings or something like that? Yeah, so we'll do, um, so I have like executive one-on-ones with everybody once a week. And then we'll have like to- one executive meeting with everybody. These are more typically like, We'll, we'll do this not, you know, we'll do this once a quarter where we do our OKR mm. meeting. So we'll figure out like, what are the things that we can improve our customer experience and how do we, you know, how do we just make people happier overall? And, and that is driving some of these initiatives. You know, it could be like, we need to hire more people to have a, a quicker response time, right? We need to really focus on accuracy so that we don't have these pussy slayer shirts shipping to people, right? And I like, love it could be it could be any of this, yeah. any of these things. And there's always it's a little bit of a quack wall because like there's a million things that are always happening. So you gotta prioritize, and it's frustrating because you want to fix them all, but it's just not possible, right? Like you gotta just pick the ones that you really want to focus on, get the team behind it, put an owner, and and then just run with it and how do you how do you stack rank like the highest leverable uh, like highest opportunities or highest leverageable opportunities when you look at all these different problems we try to quantify it based on impact so like typically it's going to be dollar amount of of like the people that have issues with it like what is the impact if they were to leave ship bunk right so if i have one small customer like complain about something that nobody else has ever complained about it's obviously going to be ranked a lot different than if i have three of my biggest customers complaining about one of specific things so we try to always put a value, quantifiable value towards um, how many dollars are at stake to figure out what we're prioritizing. What was, when, when uh, Scott asked you about a mistake, right? Now let's talk a little bit about more like a strategic big time mistake or something or a missed opportunity that you have that you said, I should have doubled down on something. Was there was anything like that that you should have said, well. Yeah, it's, you know, I, I think about this a lot because I, I always, I mean, my mindset in general tries to be, I don't want to regret things because like I want to, I feel like we are where we are because of the decisions we made and like could have been in a better place, like maybe, but I am also pretty happy where we are. So I feel like any but decision- But still, as, as a learning, as a learning That was like part. wrong, I think it would have yeah. obviously pushed us, right? But I think it's, uh, I think it's more about um, hiring the right people sooner, yeah. Yeah. which is kind of the common thing of, I think everybody says that, but yeah. it's, you know, like- we hired our first CFO when we were, I think, $70 million of, of revenue, right? Which is, and I was doing a lot of the QuickBooks before that. And so getting the visibility, getting the quality of data and getting like really the understanding of the business from a financial perspective sooner definitely would have been pretty impactful. You know, I think um, maybe like COO has been a role that I've been just trying to hire forever. And it's taken me four people to hire the right person. Now I have finally the right person. And that's for me, so if they listen, all the other ones, they know they were not the right ones. They, yeah, that's, I mean, I think they would know <laughs> anyway. But, um, but that's been the hardest role for yeah. me to hire for. And it's taken three years. And, you know, I, I wish, I mean, I don't think, I don't know what I would have done differently, but I wish I would have hired that person. It's too. a matter of luck, right? And it's, it's a matter of, well, it's also the size of the company. Because, like, I could have never attracted the guy that I have today two years before that, right? Gotcha. Like, you would have never been interested. And I think that's always a, it's always a timing thing, you know? So... Um, strategically, I think like, honestly, like, I think we're like, I'm pretty happy with where we are. So I don't think there would have been like major dramatic changes that I would have done. But you, like you, okay. So now, um, like if you look at where your revenue numbers are at now, uh, and I, I don't know if it's public or not, does it, are revenues more or less public? So you said, yeah, yeah. Like over, oh yeah. Like 350. Okay. Million so if you look at $350 million, that's significant. I mean, if you're talking about CFO at 70 COO, figuring that out right now, um, it's taken you a while to bring on the right people. But a point you made before was very interesting, how you have this like incredible lifestyle while you're still running this business, even though you're still doing, in theory, all these tasks, right? Yeah. So how did you build this business so that you can still maintain this lifestyle? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I think, I mean, I, I love to enjoy life. So like everything I do is is always, um, I just want to have a great time. And, and so I try to design my life so that it's not, in a way of like, I, I wouldn't see myself. And I did this for the first three years, right? Like I didn't do anything. Like I just worked my ass off the first three years. What I realized quick enough is that the more I let go, the more I can enjoy life, the more I can travel, the more I can do different things. I've never been able to, not until recently, like I've been able to completely disconnect where I would go on a trip and I wouldn't work. But what I realized is that like a lot of the, and this is the big, I think this is the most difficult job for any founder to kind of transition from that founder to CEO. And we used to talk about this all the time with Joe, 
where like there's Can you explain that point too? Like, what does that mean founder to ceo so so like a founder wants to be in every decision right they want to control everything they want to like they're very associated like that's the business in them is one thing where a ceo tries to disassociate themselves with the business has a little bit more of an objective view delegates more and really empowers people to make decisions and a founder is not scalable right like you can't scale that mindset over a certain size of a company depending on the industry where a CEO, like, they understand the value that they can't fix everything, right? And they have to empower the people to fix their own things and hold them accountable to fixing them. And that's been really difficult for me. I mean, it's taken me really two years in, in, in a lot of departments to kind of let go and, and empower these people to make these decisions, understanding sometimes they're going to make the wrong choice, right? But sometimes that's okay. If I feel like it's too big of a mistake, then we'll, I'll get more involved, dive in, like, try to ultimately make sure that it's not a detrimental decision to the company. But by doing that, and and I've done it in most departments, you know, kind of it's like a progression. You have a best person for HR, you have to step away in HR, right? Like you have an amazing sales guy, you can step away from sales. Operations for me has been like one of the latest ones that I, you know, been finally able to step away. So that's been taking majority of my time. But um, I've been always able to work or do enough to like when I was remote or traveling, like I've been able, I still been, you know, I was working. And, um, and while I was having an amazing time and it would recharge me to come back and like get to work and just, you know, put a lot of hours, um, kind of back into, you know, really back into the, the, and the you grind. feel like, like when you take that time off, it allows you to operate at a higher capacity. Than it allows me to disconnect from the day to day and gives me a different perspective because if you're in the office every day, right. For whatever a year straight, like you get so inundated by everybody's asking you questions. You're always like in the weeds. You're trying to solve problems that are just like fire. So right? it's just like firefighting. Everything yeah. is a fire. You're trying to just kill these fires. But if you get away and you don't have these meetings, right? And like you have to, like you actually have really a time to think about it. You get to get a different perspective on the business. Yeah. I found I found that it on the day to day, if I would step outside of my office and do stuff some restaurant i would be doing all the stuff that i don't do that are higher level than fi- uh, turning off fires because people would walk into your office it's not all the time, time. Everyone, yeah so, everyone so you, can, you can on... you yeah because your your mindset is important and urgent and every time like you know it, it takes a second let me do it it might not be even urgent or important and you cut, get yourself caught up with little little stuff so unless you're in a meeting or something like that people would come in so I, I, I found it absolutely true that you get out. Even don't have to take a trip doing snowboarding, something, but you just walk out of the office, you do it in a restaurant, you spend a couple hours, all the emails you needed to do, all the new opportunities for tomorrow there, and then you go back and you make sure. You know what else helped me a lot um, to kind of like shy away from this, that little interruptions of the day? Simple. Just write a list of what you got to do. Write a list. And it took me a while to actually say, okay, I'm, I'm not as productive. I'm getting to the same point. Just write a list. I'm, I'm busy now. Let me finish this. Is it that important right now? Do I have to do it today? Okay, no. Okay. All, once I tackle all those, I'm free to do everything else. Yeah. It was, it was helpful. I mean, I think structure and overall, like, like I'm a pretty organized person, right? Like, try to, you know, I'm big in working in, and, and like, I use Asana for everyday life. I use Slack, obviously, to communicate with the company. But, like, everything I do, my day, when I plan it, um, you know, I have tasks that are like urgent that I need to do that are kind of more tactical, but I also literally create projects that are more strategics that are more brainstorming where I like pull in people and I love to balance both. Right. So like, I, I really love getting into product meetings and talking about like, Hey, this is our problem. I bring in stakeholders from different parts of the company. We brainstorm, we come up with a solution. And then from that, right, I'll go into a meeting, like a strategic, strategic meeting. And we say, where do we want to be in five years as a company from a margin growth, you know, revenue, customer profile, and like balancing those two is super important. Sometimes like because you're in the day to day and like, if, especially if you're killing fires all the time, like it almost seems like the world is ending, mm-hmm. right? Because like everything you're doing is problem solving. And even though you love problem solving, which I do, it just seems, it just makes your brain so focused on these, um, you know, little issues that it's very difficult to kind of zoom out yeah. where if you leave, People that have these little issues, they're not going to go to you. They know you're gone, right? And so, like, you have to finally kind of, like, look from above and, and, and look at Did that. Did you get to a point that they already know not to bug you with little things and there are other people? And unless yeah, it's I urgent, mean, I, I, they come to you? Yeah. 
Because that's where the the health of the company starts falling into place. Where, I mean, you said you you found a CEO, and I can. I mean, we spoke about this before, Eric. You know, Eric. Yeah. It was in, instrumental, right? I got lucky. I got him early on when I was in fifty at fifty million, but it was pretty much taking off a lot of that noise, and and it was also helpful because sometimes you need someone to tell you, I don't think you should be messing with this. There are bigger things to do. Let Julie take care of it. Did Eric, did Eric say that to you? Oh, yeah, all the time. Because the yeah, thing is with good. Eric, he was going with, he was working in Chewy with Ryan Cohen. He was seeing the transformation and he said, look, we've seen this. We've seen the, the good, bad, and the ugly where, where founders are founders. There's that, that, that CEO disease, the founder CEO disease, which is kind of like can't let go. You have your favorites, all that. And, and it's good to hear it, right? You, you hear it one time, it's like, ah. It's you know, but that's the, yeah. I think that's the most difficult thing. And, and it just really depends on the personality of the CEO. But it's like, it becomes, you know, there's this thing that like, it's really lonely at the top, right? And I think that's so true because most people are never going to give you honest feedback as a CEO. Mm -hmm. And I actually still to this day haven't really found a good way to get honest feedback. Because I, I try to ask for it all the time. But like, if I work for you, like, it's difficult for me to tell you like, hey, you suck at this. You shouldn't do this. Like unless we have a really strong relationship and we work together for a long time. So I have few people in the company that will try to tell me, because it's, it's actually the opposite. Everybody's trying to kiss your ass all the time, right? They're like, they, they never want to tell you the bad news. They want to make themselves look in the best light. You know, it, it's, it's, so it's difficult to really see yourself for who you are, which I think is one of the most difficult things as a CEO is to actually get honest feedback about yourself and figure out how you can be better. What about you, your partners, your, your investors? They, I mean, they, Are they, they, high they level yeah, they but they, get... they don't know how I operate, right? Like they, you know, we, we, I see them at board meetings and they have pretty good input strategically, but like they wouldn't be the ones telling me like, Hey, this is not the stuff you should be involved with, or mm -hmm. this is not how you should have communicated this. It's not, you yeah. know, you should have yelled at this guy, like whatever that is. Right. Like it's, so I think I try to be more reflective to really become, and I have a CEO coach who kind of helps me with this, but you know, it's like, it would be super helpful to have somebody on the team that's like. And I, I used my uh, head of HR, um, which actually used to be head of HR for Chewy too for a long time, to kind of coach me on these situations where it's like, hey, like, don't get upset. Like, think mm -hmm. about it. Step, take a step back. And then let's have that conversation next week. And that's important because you're always passionate as a founder, right? And so, like, you want to you have this instinct of solving problems and everything is a nail, you know, when you're But happy. do you feel sometimes it's time to say no? Because, I, I mean, you said, look, I know what to strip down. Okay, now I don't need to do HR, do someone good. I don't have to do customer service. But operation, I, I still couldn't find another me or better to go and take over. So I'm going to stay there, right? And then you find yourself going to the granular details and they tell you, I don't deal with the minutia. If someone comes to tell you that, like, well, if I don't deal with this type of minutia, that minutia is actually important. Yeah. So, so you kind of like make those, do you still find yourself in yeah. those positions? Yeah, for sure. Because I think what, and this is, I think, where a lot of leaders fail, where, you know, I've seen this in our business, where some leaders are just going to want to be high level, like on um, the head of yeah. sales. Like, I don't need to understand how our, like, sales guys take a call and like, what's our value prop or whatever, right? Like, I, I have massive issue with that. Yeah. And, <laughs> no, no, no. It's a, it's a, it's a biggest issue. Yes. And, yeah. and I've hired the wrong people um, yeah. sometimes, right? Because... They'll think like, oh, they're this entitled like VP person or like whatever. And it's below them to like get down in the weeds and do this stuff, yeah. right? And there's so many people like that. And I have a huge issue because in my mind, like if you are overseeing a certain department, you should know and be able to replace any single person on your percent. team, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because if you can't answer a basic ticket as a VP of customer success, then like how can you coach people or like keep them accountable to answering these types of tickets, right? Like it doesn't really make a lot of sense. And so... I think that balance between being able to do a deep dive when you need to versus staying high level and delegating to your leaders is extremely important. And you can do, you know, you can't just be in the weeds all the time because then like you're not really useful, but you have to keep that balance because that's the only way to really like scale a business. You know, let me, let me say something. When you, when you grow a company, and this is where I want you to tell me how you guys do it. I guess the challenge is once you start tearing the organization from being very flat, it was just you, Johnny, and, and, and managing a bunch of people. Now there's just, just you, then there's C-levels and VPs or SVP. So, uh, how many, by the way, how many tiers do you have in your, in your organization? So it depends on the department. Like, you know, mostly, I mean, we have VPs, directors. Um, is it from, 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 from the lowest to the CEO, how many levels? Yeah, I mean... It, Four or five, six? It, like... On average, I would say five. Like okay, operations, so five. operations is like nine, for example. Okay, but within them, they have okay, so they have more. Okay, so yeah. then, do you find yourself being more structured with meetings, where some people spend more time in meetings than actually working, or 
you're able to dodge that and and still keep yourself uh, more like back Are in the day. Just into one like or two big company problems yes. now. I guess at twenty five hundred. It's a yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think we're definitely. Yes, I think we do. I think we're slowing down in a lot of the decision making ability that we used to have, like agility. I think any like innovation is tied to agility, and I think agility is so important in success of any business. The mm. whole reason why companies, big companies, get outcompeted by small guys with no money, is because they just, you know, they're like they're able to innovate, pivot on the spot. And I, one of because the because I, I, I asked a question by the way. I'm sorry, I cut you off. Because when you said quarterly re, uh, review meetings that I have, it's like that was the fr- when, once you hear that, it's kind of like a. A formula, okay, there's the annual, there's semi, there's quarterly, there's just all those meetings that, that kind of give me stomach ache when I hear. And <laughs> it's like, you know, it's funny because, like, it, it, and I think there's a balance, right? Because, like, I hate the whole concept of, oh, we are going to be a corporation, things are going to be slow, we're going to be all these, like, bullshit meetings that everybody has. But at some point, though, like, you realize there's no other way to run a company because if you get a certain size, you have to be able to have some sort of structure. Otherwise, like the company is kind of fall apart. So like even if you're a CEO that like doesn't want a structure and I, the, you know, I hate having me- weekly meetings, but, but if I don't, I'm never going to actually. Like, Absolutely. You need, you need to connect everybody. You need bridges. You need to make sure that everybody's on the same page. But the, the challenge I've, I've seen with meetings is because I've seen both sides. In Baxi Cham, we were small amount of corporate people. Then we had lots of, uh, I mean, our fulfillment wasn't done by us. So that cuts off hundreds of employees. And if you took, you know, uh, if you look at customer service, yeah, we had people in customer service, but most of them were outsourced or hundreds of them. All, but the idea was always like about 150 employees, right? Running a $500 million business. And then when we were acquired by Ipsy, similar story, right? But they had about 500 employees, but still similar story, almost the same revenue. They're about 20% more. And it was all night and day. And when they said, okay, you're going to manage BoxyCharm after two weeks, I said, okay, I'm not doing that. That's it. I'm not staying in meetings all day. From every day, all day. And it was just all my team had to be in meetings all day. None of them did the job. So obviously it's needed once you have more people, right? They had 16 layers from the bottom all the way to the CEO. We had four or five yeah. or something like that. Yeah. But the, the, the question is, when are you start seeing that you're overly doing that so you stop yourself from it? How do you know yeah, it's, that I mean, you it's feel honestly like... honestly something we're dealing with right now, right? Because how do you know whether you have too many layers or... Not too or, many layers, like too many meetings? Or too maybe, unnecessary maybe, or too no, many people in meetings? No, but maybe too many layers leads to too many meetings exactly. because you have to... That is... Well, that is it's, it's, yeah, and so like a great example in yeah. our customer support team, right? Like we, uh, you know, we, we, we kind of merged when we acquired uh, one of these companies that we bought... We merged the support team, so we have about 150 people on our support team. And it's a mix of customer support, account management, fairly complex stuff, right? But you've got 150 people, and originally, you know, we would have, like, one person that would basically, like, or a team of, like, four people, then we would have an account manager, and then maybe they would report to a VP. So, like, three layers, right? And then we kind of did a reorg early in the year. Somehow, I don't even know how this happened, but we, like, basically created, like, six or seven layers. Mm. And then what we realized, it wasn't necessarily the meetings in this particular case. It was the time it took to make a decision. Because Everyone if Joe true. here yeah. didn't know what to do, he went to his VP, yeah. right? Like, that guy didn't feel empowered, so he went to his, like, manager. That manager didn't really know what to do, so went to the, the, direct, mm. the, the, the junior director and then the senior director. And then by the time this all happened, a week went by, and wow. the customer, like was like, where is my answer, right? And like, yeah. there's a balance between empowering people and like getting too many approvals. And you need to have structure in place where, you know, you wanna, you wanna balance between empowering people and So like when you have a, a situation like this, okay, when you said, okay, a box is not being shipped, right? Sometimes the proper way to, to structure a meeting makes more sense because it's a similar situation where I so saw after we were acquired where there are so many meetings, so many people, but pe- people didn't get their boxes on time complains months and months goes by and then the most important part was every day every week should be a meeting where everyone is synced are there any delays who's going to be delayed why are they going to be delayed can we in advance preemptively go and contact them right it wasn't passed on to the next business so ideally is that it's not about the and i guess the challenge is like not about how many meetings is the substance of the meetings and when you i i always looked at this as from the morning until say 2 p.m., you gotta make sure that those people work the actual work and do yeah. tactical stuff. 
everything else after pushing the meetings because the, you're the most productive before you have your lunch time. Yeah. So you're more creative, more passionate. Meetings is just draining. Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on the the role, right? Like, there's you got individual contributors who should spend most of their time working. I think the higher up you get, the more meetings you're spending time with. But like, if you're a VP of support, right? Like, most of your day is not going to be actually working. It's going to be managing your team. And so, if you're managing your team, you have to be meeting with the individual team members. Maybe you meet with customers. But there's not a lot of like busy work that people do in those roles. And so, I think there's a balance between the, my mindset's always been creating a structure so that you don't have repetitive meetings about things that can be solved separately outside of the meeting, right? In my mind, a meeting is used for, I need people's input or I need to brainstorm about a problem we have. How do we come up with a solution? And then let's take it away and actually work on this, right? And maybe we meet in a week to brainstorm again, where I think this breaks down as like, hey, like we need to review the boxes that didn't ship and then you bring 10 people in every single time. Like that doesn't make sense to me because it's like, that's the same problem that happens every single week. Like, you don't need 10 people for that, right? Like, let's have a report. Let's have one person own it and then let them figure out, like, what they're doing instead of trying to pull in people from, like, 20 different places, right? So I think there's a difference between, like, repetitive meetings that I don't really, I'm not a big fan of where are trying to, like, solve a repeatable problem versus we need to come up with a solution to a problem like this that will then prevent us from having those meetings in the future, if that makes sense. On a side note, you know, Czech Republic... This is the country that consumes more beer per capita than any other country true? in the world. So I'm drinking tequila. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm being the anomaly of Czech yeah. people. Um, when you have all these layers, I'm curious as to how you came to all these layers. And when I think about why you would add on layers, is because you want to incentivize people to join your organization. You want to show them room for growth or whatever. And then you want you basically want to help them grow in their career. But then you have like the seven layers that you didn't even... So it's a, have, yeah, have so it's a, it's a great, that's a great point because I've never thought about it that way, right? Like I've never thought about, I want to create layers so that people have career growth, right? Like, and, and, and this is my like weakness where I don't really think that way for people where I'm like, oh, I want to hire people so that but they the have thing every... Is you, for, I think, I don't think you should actually, I don't think you should do that. Yeah, I, I, you should well, create... I, I do think there's an element to it, right? But and you I'm should learning, find other ways. For, yeah, yeah. And I'm learning like, especially from a COO who's worked with a company with 25,000 people where like you need to do that. Otherwise you start having big retention problems. So yeah. there's definitely a world where that makes sense. But I've always thought about it more like, okay, like is this person way too overwhelmed with what they're doing? And if they are, that means most likely they're managing way too many people or they don't have good people that are under them. So we need to put mm -hmm. a layer in between yeah. to really help them like bridge it, right? Yeah. So like, it's never, for me at least, it's never been like, oh, we need you know this person's like ability to grow. Like I think that like with us, we because we've grown so quickly, there's always opportunities for So I'm sorry, so, so let me just point. articulate this. So you're saying in the way you've seen the growth was, okay, a, one manager cannot manage more than six people. Now we have already 12, okay, we need another manager, but someone has to manage. Once you have three managers, someone has exactly. to manage them. Now, right, 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 right. As, as natural growth of people, now you're gonna go and have another layer, which is a director. Otherwise, you're gonna have a manager managing two people, but because you, you need yep, to have a yep. bunch of layers and it makes no sense, I guess. Exactly, right. Yes. And sometimes what we find ourselves in, it's like, we have one person managing one person and then they manage a team of three people, right? And I'm like, that doesn't make any sense, like why? But that's, that's, that's a promotion for career progression exactly. and not yeah, yeah. It's, it's a bullshit promotion. Yeah, it's yeah, a totally people wanted the title to put on the resume well, yeah, well, for I mean, the right reasons. Actually. It's a problem if, with if the millennial generation, right? Like everybody wants to direct value, you know, value in the company. Right? So your junior director managing the same reports, direct reports as a senior director. I mean... No, to the director, which reports to the senior director. Yeah, exactly. There's already extra layer. Junior, that, senior, yeah, I mean, it, junior, no junior, and then a senior. This so. is the thing where like, I just get so tired of these corporate bullshit. It is. Like, it's so like, like <laughs> Politics, right? Yeah. So like politics, I've never heard that word in our company ever until, until a year you ago, start right? doing it. Where, yes. you know, now it's like, man, like, we can't do this because there's this... I'm like, how... You know, like, we're here to run a business. Like, we don't... And I'm not the most empathetic whole leader I would say like I you know I try to get shit done and sometimes hey guys I, I'm about to go on a ski vacation please finish <laughs> it up all right <laughs> no but like I you know like as a my mindset is like hey let's get this thing resolved yeah and and I kind of sometimes like don't really worry about people's feelings as much which maybe especially in the US it's a little you're bit you're gonna of a get canceled on this you podcast be, no, 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 but you know what you. if you if you if you're aware enough of yourself and how you lead then you find somebody that is better at managing people yeah, That's ex fine. yeah exactly and it's and it's you know like it's 
And, and I'm well aware of that. That's totally my weakness, right? Like something can be pretty tough and it's not the best for the organization, for culture and all that stuff, but it gets shit done, right? The opposite of that, which is the things that I also hate, it's like, you know, you, you suck at your job and I don't want to tell you that. So I'll pay you on the back and say, hey, you're amazing. But like this thing, like, you know, can you please do it better next time, right? And that doesn't change anything either. So like, I think there's a balance between being, you know, walking around and patting people I, I don't think and it's telling how great thing. they're doing. John, I think you're doing the right thing because once you actually give a compliment, people cherish it. It matters. Yeah, it yeah. matters, right? Yeah, not, but, it's, yeah. not a cheap, it's not a cheap compliment because well, you do it all the time. It's a, it's a Eastern European thing, right? Like we're not used to, even as kids, like our parents don't praise us for doing normal <laughs> things, right? Yeah. And you get in this like award culture that is typically in the US where like every kid wants an award even if they'll last. Yeah. So it's like... Everybody wants an award or they want, you know, to say how great of a job they're doing, even if they suck. And so, like, the the school of thought I come from, and this is more uh, where I grew up, is, like, you get a good job or thank you if you really do a great job. If you just do your job, I don't tell you anything. If you suck, I'll tell you suck. And it's not, like, again, I, I've been learning to change that a little bit. So I'm more, you know, even people that kind of do their job, like, I'll tell them they're doing a great job. And it's not the most doesn't make me like doesn't come naturally to me and it but it does produce results it doesn't always create the so best re environment reinforce the status quo does produce results for you i think if you have strong leaders it does if you have people that need that right like it's all about recognizing people's um like like egos because yeah. like there's people that are very sensitive and they want praise all the time and then but, but, i mean john listen i've been to your headquarters and i can leave there you have this huge screens when you walk into his headquarters here in Deerfield where was it for Lauderdale, Fort Lauderdale. Yeah. it's you you walk into I think 250,000 square feet but he probably took about 20 or 30,000 square feet just for office space where he made it a loft and in between in that section he he has a stage and there is you know those TVs that are all connected I'm talking something like yeah, 18 yeah. feet like what you see at a feet. sports bar or something yeah, huge yeah, yeah. no huge. it's one big screen yeah, and cool. then he has a whole arcade area and, and cables and, and he throw parties over there oh, so you want to work there so you're talking about okay <laughs> so no, listen no, no, I'm, if I, you're, you're not doing a great job yeah, you're yeah. Strict, I'm a super but, nice guy right like, yeah. overall <laughs> but I do expect a lot from people right yeah. and I think that's where the balance is and, and you know and that's why like I need people especially my executive team like my executive team knows that I can be tough but they also know I'm fair, right? Like I'm not tough because I, you know, because I like, if I tell you to do something and then it doesn't happen, then I can be tough. But I also appreciate when you do something right. And I, that's why honestly, like having that layer of really strong executives under me has been super beneficial to everybody, right? Because sometimes like I get emotional and I get, you know, I, I, I want to get shit done. And sometimes people's emotions get so in they the buffer way. You a little they, bit. They, they, they buffer me. Yeah. yeah. And it's been really good because you know, like it's, it, it doesn't, my type of leadership doesn't work for everybody. And it's, and it's sometimes, especially for a broader population, it's not always positive, right? Joe gets like that too. Like he can get pretty riled up. I don't believe, it. I don't believe in cheap popularity. Yeah. I believe, I believe in being who you are and I'm not trying to go, I, I'm, I'm a pretty awesome person. I think I'm a fun guy. <laughs> Ask my, my ex-wife. I'm sure she's going to say that, but, but I definitely agree that, that you don't get things done just because you give flowers to everybody. You have to go and explain to them, look, that was the mistake. You go with substance, explain why. But you also you have say, to know how to manage people based on their personality. For sure. They could be oh, high absolutely. performance, but you have to know absolutely. how they Absolutely, yes. Yeah. yeah, because this is not zeros and ones, right? You're yeah. not managing computer. You are going to have emotions. People are not always going to be the way you want them to speak. It is what it is, and it's fine. As long as they come with substance. I think the, the point I'm taking from what you're saying is the yes people is something that I couldn't stand. People tell you you're right about everything, and I need your Which fucking feedback. Yeah. Don't go and tell me I'm right about everything. I want you to tell me where I'm wrong. And what I used to say is, look, if you said I'm right and I do it and I fail, I'll come back and I say, okay, you're no longer giving me leverage. Just yeah. remember that. I'll go to someone else. You're not doing, I want you to tell me, and I, the ones that I kept with me across uh, along uh, the, throughout the journey were the ones that would debate me all the time. It was, it was, it was easy for well, me also, to pick them. It's also super important to be able to like, be self-aware enough where you can take negative feedback and you're self-aware of if you made a mistake. And I think it goes a long way when you admit to the people, like, let's just say that I, I think you fucked something up, right? And I'll come and tell you, you fucked something up and I'll go around like, hey, like, you, you know, we need to, this is how we need to be better, whatever. And if I find out that that's wrong, like my assumption was that you screwed something up, but you actually didn't, it was like something else happened, then I have to own that and I have to be very direct about, hey, I'm sorry, 
I fucked up. I thought it was your fault. It really wasn't your fault. Like I apologize and then move on. I think a lot of people have big enough ego where like they just don't want to do that. Yeah, do it, and then yeah. it screws up the culture because then it's like, oh, this yeah. guy's always right. And that's like, I will the first one to admit that I'm wrong. You know, I'll question everything that like, if I have an opinion, I want everybody else to validate it or have a discussion about like, okay, what are we doing next? And I think that's where I've learned like leadership is so important because you want to make a firm decision when you are making it as a leader. But I think having everybody else's feedback and like, thoughts before you make that decision and make like really thinking through it with them loops them in the process and then make sure that everybody's bought in right where like if you just you know if 10 people tell you like oh this is the wrong way and then you just go for it anyway like i think that doesn't create a good culture because then they feel like it's not one team yeah yeah i gotta i gotta ask you now a question that probably everyone asked you that before because i know anyone like us get those questions when you cashed out what was your feeling <laughs> Um, why, why did you cash out? I guess that's that's also a good question. Well, let's start with one question at a time. Why would you want to get a couple of? Why would you want to get a couple hundred million dollars? I, I think it's. But we can go back to it. But when you cash okay. out, when did you actually process that? Shit, my life is different. How long did it take you to process? So, that? yeah, I mean, it's a great question, right? And it's funny because when I started, my whole goal of the business was like one time at one point I want to sell and my goal was to sell it for more than hundred million. And then I did, you know, I did this kind of funny back of the napkin math that like, if I sell it for hundred million, I'll have $5,000 every day for the rest of my life to, to live my life. Um, so, you know, then I eventually realized, oh, this actually not how it works. You know, you first you pay taxes and then you actually can make money on your money. So yeah. it was very naive. Like, you know, I was 21 years old, uh, math, but that just, you were sitting with head. us in the EO group and he said, I need a hundred million. Then he came back. Actually, I need more than a hundred million. Actually, <laughs> it's going to be enough because I mean, it, it was, it was really funny. It was like, I want this RV to travel over the world. I remember something like that. Yes. <laughs> By the way, I just bought uh, congrats. two weeks ago. Nice. Yeah. But, uh, so, yeah, so anyway, so I had this dream of like one day I want to sell the company. I knew I didn't want to do the business forever, like my whole life, right? We ran the process. Um, you know, we didn't really know if we we're going to sell the whole business through strategic or private equity. And then the process kind of ultimately end up landing where it did, meaning selling, you know, half the company through private equity. And it was, um, the beauty was like, I knew that it gives me options, right? So like at that time, like I'm, you know, I've cashed out enough where I would have not had to work for the rest of my life. But at the same time, I still had a massive upside um, for the business to do really well. And so it was kind of the best of, best of both worlds. It didn't obviously give me the freedom to kind of like walk away and say, okay, like now I'm going to, you know, travel through Africa in my RV for a year. But uh, it gave me enough financial freedom to be able to, to know that I will be able to do it in the future and that I don't really have to worry about you know, buying falafel yeah. and uh, <laughs> falafel every day as falafel much as you want. Day. Yeah. Falafel every day. You're good. You're falafel good. every day. It's my, always my dream. Um, no, but it's it's so the feeling was um, honestly very. It was it was. When did it relief. hit it? Was it right away when you saw the no, money? Or was it? It after? wasn't relief. It was it was. Our process was very stressful at the end because, you know, we started in like the sum. Well, we started really in March, and then COVID hit 2020. Nobody was doing anything. So then over the summer, we were kind of prepping everything, talking to investors. September, we started getting offers. We got a massive amount of offers, which felt really good, right? Then we kind of narrowed it down to like five, six, went through the process, ultimately ended up, you know, picking the one that we picked. But throughout the last two weeks, like there were so many uh, things that have changed between the offers we had, you know, valuations, terms. So like it wasn't really until the, the thing was signed like four in the morning, the day before Thanksgiving, that we knew... We have a deal done. And until that point, you're like, man, like I can literally lose everything, you know, like it's like, well, not lose, but you know, the deals, you can just all fall apart and the last six months are gone. So that was super stressful. So getting the deal done was incredible. And eventually when I got the money, like nothing's much changed. Actually. But you did feel something after, no? I felt, um, I mean, I felt relieved. I felt, you know, I would say. I, I mean, I, I definitely, there was a the, the, the temporary moment of happiness when you realize, like, oh, man, like, this is really cool. Did you feel a little bit of stress, maybe, with all that cash? Well, I started feeling stress, not immediately, but I would say probably a couple months after when I really started to think about, like, where I'm going to invest this money. Yeah. Because you realize, Parking like, the money. man, like, you know, I've got all this cash. This is great, but it's a responsibility, right? Yeah. Now, this was, remember, this was 20, like 21 when inflation started to come up to like eight, nine percent. Yeah. And you're like, well, if you don't invest this money by end of the year, it's 10 percent down in value. Right. And so everybody was like, oh, you got to invest the money. You got to invest the money. 
and everything was so expensive, right? Like, like everything, like stocks, companies, private equity, like real estate. So I was like, well, I, you know what? I, I think something bad's going to happen. I'm just going to hold on. And I only put a little bit of money to equities. And right now I feel like the hero, you know, it's like, yeah. I, I, like I, most of my investments, well, most of my money is in cash. It's just sitting in the bank yeah. waiting to be deployed. Um, you know, I'm doing some stuff in like renewable energy and then a couple like private equity funds, but I'm just waiting for the right opportunity. Yeah, because this is, this is a journey that a lot of us go through, right? It's just, there is that stress, especially when you see, I mean, just, I, I saw the life to good. The fact you said a lot of us go through and anybody listening is like, no, the stress, <laughs> the people, yeah, no, I mean, the stress, the stress, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that is, yeah. The stressful part is because you, you go and you see how luxury goods went up like two times than what yeah. it was. I mean, yeah, what, you a, wanted shitty, to buy what a shitty for, thing for me. It's just for not a good, <laughs> like everything went up. Wow, now, now you can only buy one bag for yeah. $5,000, not yeah. two bags anymore. Yeah, it's like there's nothing available. Everything is overpriced. Nothing. So it's like my money doesn't, and the inflation is the not really e horrible, accurate. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. A no, yacht no, is 180, not 150,000 anymore. <laughs> No, but the idea is that you know that that it's a representation of the inflation. And you said, well, even if they say it's eight percent, it's bullshit. It's not really eight percent. Because try to buy a house in the islands right now. It went from ten to thirty. No, but so, you know what but but you know what I think is the biggest thing is the for me at least, it was the anxiety of not knowing what I was doing. So yeah. like you ask me anything about logistics fulfillment, like I'm an expert, I'll tell you everything, right? Like you can really surprise me. In investment or investing in general. I knew nothing about investing. Like I've never invested a dollar before that, right? Like I, I was managing the company's money in a way, right? But it was very familiar environment. I think where this threw me off a little bit is like, okay, I got all this money and now I have to get into like a whole new industry with totally different rules, totally different KPIs, totally different like everything and try to make money in that. And I think that's what was giving me. Was that like that you felt like, okay, there are other top predators. I'm not one of them. It was, and yeah, exactly. It's like, I'm like a, you know, I'm like a, a little like barista in a Starbucks. Like, yeah. I like I have no idea what I'm doing, right? Like, this is kind of the level that I fell in that investment world. So like, you're a, you're a rock star operator. You have a great company. You know, you know, a lot about operating a business. You walk into this new industry of like investing money and you realize you're nobody. Like, you know nothing, you know yeah. nobody. So you start learning and then you realize every, the more you learn, the more you realize how much you don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the more you realize like everybody tells you different things. Like, people don't really like, you know, Went everybody has interest. different interests in mind yeah. and like it's it's really exciting but scary at the same time. Right. And so like I've gone through an interesting journey over the last year and a half. I, I would say I'm like on that journey to 100, maybe at 10 percent, like I feel like, you know, and it's, it's it, I feel more comfortable now, but I still it yeah. still gives it's me a long a, road. It's a long yeah. road. And, and it's hard to like. And even the good ones don't really know that, that what you what bothers you is that even the really good ones. They don't always win. They don't always know. It's not like logistic that if you know, you know, and it's all, it's gonna be okay. Like, yeah. But, but yeah, it's it's a challenging business. What's your um? Actually, I wanted uh, it's it's a side note. Um, there was a funny story you told me about a guy that got scammed with a five thousand dollar. How he got a call and there was <laughs> someone in his company. Yeah. Got this email say, hey, this is John. Who's a oh, new this manager. has happened like three times since, by the Three way. times, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's actually it's good like for a, companies. Like a fishing scheme? Anyone, yeah, fishing scheme. Yeah. It's good for anyone that has a company to hear this out because it, it does happen. Yeah. Cybersecurity so, exposure. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's so, so basically we would have a new employee and like every time we have a new employee, somehow people find out their phone number. I guess it's maybe when they change it on their LinkedIn or whatever. Yeah. And then they'll get a text from me saying, Hey John, you know you're available, um, and they're like, "Oh, this is Jam." They're like, "Yeah, hey, like I'm available." They all want to impress me, right? And then they're like, "Well, you know, I kind of need you. Like, we have a, an issue with a customer, and I'm not available right now. Like, can you run and give me some like Target gift cards for this customer?" And they're like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, sure." And so this guy, this was a new warehouse manager in California, went to Target, right, and then bought whatever five hundred dollar gift cards and like scrapes them, text them back to the, to me. He thinking, right. And then the guy's like, oh, thank you. Like, you're so amazing. And by the way, like, can you also go to Apple Store to buy more gift cards? So this guy <laughs> gets out of the Target, goes to Apple Store, buys like $2,000 of gift cards. And by the way, the reason why it's 2000 is because they always cap it. You can't buy more than a certain amount. For, for fraud. Fraud Probably reasons, for right? fraud, yeah. He goes there, buys these cards, pays. Then he goes to like Walmart. And he just sends them to all these places, right? He ends up basically buying $13,500 of gift cards. Oh, my God. The only reason he didn't buy more is because he wiped out his entire debit card account, right? Like he had no more money in his account. So that's why he stopped buying the cards. And then obviously, like, you know, then when he bought all them, he was like, oh, yeah, thank you. You're so good. And then like 
he submits a request for reimbursement, right, to the company. And we're like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> and we just look at it and we're like, yeah, you just totally got scammed. Like it was a total phishing scam. You know, they just pretended from a random number to be me. And um, he didn't really think to question it. And it's happened. Like, I mean, it's happened a lot, but four other people actually end up buying some oh gift my cards. God. Just pretty crazy, huh? Yeah, it's insane. It's insane. I mean, uh, it's, uh, it's something that we used to get all the time. People would get email, emails from me. That the thing with me is that if I wanted to talk to you, I would come into your desk, knock on your door, whatever office. So people knew that wouldn't be Joe. So then I had to change my email address from what it was. Oh, you guys had like a big scam issue, right? Like oh, yeah. We had a different type of scam. Yeah, so we had a scam where someone somehow got through uh, the email through our uh, one of the brands we worked with, and they were supposed to send us a wire. So I guess they hacked their email. And they knew that they have to send us an email. So they sent us an email in their behalf saying, hey, listen, um, we, we changed our email, our, our wire instru instruction. Can you send it over there? Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm in the Philippines getting a call from my, C my CFO saying, oh, man, we got to get a lawyer. Can you help me? I'm like, what are you talking about? Anyway, he said, yeah, the, that company, uh, they, um, they didn't send us the money. And they said that we need to, uh, we need to go and uh, pay them. But we did pay them. I said, wait a minute. Did you check that we actually paid them? And then he said, yeah, we did. They just changed the email address. I said, and did you check that it was actually their email? Apparently it wasn't their email. Said, okay, so we got scammed. Senor, you should have... Did you just send the different wire instructions oh based on God. some email without calling, verifying? Well, uh, anyway, it was... And then we got lucky. It was 17500 we, we called it fast enough. We called the bank. The bank actually reversed, reversed it, it. and God. we had insurance, but it was only 17 and a half. The next one was 750,000 because they already got into our email system. And then they found out there was one. They actually got into one girl's email, I guess. That's, that's how we did that. We found. So then they found out there was another email. There was another wire for 750. And then they said, hey, can you wire us? By then we already knew. So we dodged a much bigger bullet. Something that's happened in my company some hacker has found a way without my password because we've checked it to spoof my actual email. Email, yeah. No, so that happens. Like my my not a fake email, I, not like a lookalike, like the exact. That's how email. I got scammed by Airbnb. Yeah, it's like the craziest thing. So and like I, Airbnb. They, yeah. So I so I booked. This was a long time. Well, this was like in the beginning, right? So I bought. Uh, I rented a house for New Year's uh, for my parents, my wife's parents. And like we all were gonna go to this house in the mountains, and I booked it through Airbnb, right? And then I basically get an email from, like, literally it came from Airbnb.com address. Like, it was, like, info at Airbnb.com. And the email had all the listing. It looked exactly like an what? Airbnb's email. And it said, hey, um, you know, thank you for, like, booking with Airbnb. Like, in order to finish this payment, because this house is in Europe, which is, like, that's what I thought. Because in Europe, like, a lot of times you just pay with a wire mm -hmm. to pay for accommodation, hotels, whatever. This was 2012 or something. So it wasn't as uncommon. And they were like, just wire this, you know, 4,000 euros, whatever, to this, to this uh, wow. bank account in, in the UK, by the way, which was like in Bar Barclays Bank. So it wasn't like I was wiring it to Kenya. Yeah. So I was like, oh, okay, it doesn't sound that weird. So I wired them the money. This is the craziest thing. And then they sent me the confirmation. Your booking is confirmed. You know, here's like checking they sent instructions. They confirmation. Everything. Like the whole thing, right? At least they're here's saying. The, but here's the craziest the thing. Like so I nice. was, so I was supposed to arrive. This was like from not, December 29th. Then I was arriving on December 30th. My parents, my wife's parents, came on December 29th to that house in Austria. Drove for 10 hours, right? They get to where the house <laughs> is supposed to be, the address, and they call me up and they're like, hey, there's no house here. And I'm like, wow. what do you mean there's no house? They're like, yep, there's literally, like it's an empty lot. And I'm just like, that doesn't make any sense. And so I started looking, digging into it. I call Airbnb support. And they're like, yeah, like we don't actually have any kind of confirmation from the seller. They didn't ever confirm that it's available. And... Like, sorry. And they never gave me my money back. Like wow. it was, but somehow that email, their email was spoofed. Yeah. And it wasn't like, I don't know how people do it, but that's just. I don't know how they do it, but thank God my I'm team knows idea. me well enough. Cause it's always cryptic. It's like, Hey Scott, urgent, please text me back immediately. Or it's like, Hey employee, it's Scott. It's urgent. Please text me back immediately. By the way, if you were a scammer, like, isn't there a better way to do this? Like, don't be that obvious. Right? Yeah. Like, right. Like, they're like, you know, all these, like, yeah, all, this, and all this, yeah, all those issues. Like you can, you can totally make it much more. Uh, believable yeah. yeah believable yeah. well you would be very good at this Joe like if you were amazing. Like, if you lived in amazing. Kenya I feel like you would have like a you know Absolutely. like a whole rig of people and just yeah. like Lagos 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 yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
I, I, I would business? I would have I would automate this. Business. Yeah. Yeah. I would have built an Listen, AI. That, honest, I don't need any any room with people. I would have had a good AI that can speak better than people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they have that Absolutely. now. They have oh AI yes. Oh, yes. I'm sure. Yeah. yeah, it's crazy what you can do with AI now. Yeah. You do AI. Years paint. ago, I heard I heard the uh, AI scamming. It's scary. AI scam. Well, I mean, it just combines it. It yeah. combines AI writing with somebody who can send an email. Oh my god. Yeah. Um. Yeah, we get scammed. It's awesome. Yeah, it's awesome. Getting scammed is awesome. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> what an experience, guys. Experience, yeah. That's how you live your life. You just get scammed yeah, and then awesome. like, there's nothing else to uh, Listen, John, I want to thank you for coming over, taking that, that 44 minutes drive all the way from the islands in Miami to... <laughs> it was about like an hour and 15. But okay. yeah, an hour and 15. Well, sorry about that. Traffic. You know, so great seeing you. Great seeing you right. too. Yeah, and uh, we're going to probably have you again on our podcast. You're amazing and continue to succeed. Cool. Thank awesome. you. Thanks. Good stuff. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thanks, man. Thank awesome. you.